Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today we're looking at a couple of familiar faces from Creation Ministries International, but they're talking about a subject that I'm not sure I've ever covered on my channel, what they call radio halos and are more properly called alpha particle halos. So let's take a look. Radio halos ruin radiometric dating. Our topic is about nuclear dating, radiometric dating, and some powerful evidence that gives it artificially inflated dates. What would be the naturally inflated date, I wonder? Some of you might be thinking, what? How yeah. can it be wrong? It's physics, it's nuclear decay, which can be measured. So how can it give wrong dates? And others, like me, who have at least a cursory understanding of some of the nuances of the different dating methods, will be aware that there are several things that need to be accounted for that creationists often like to ignore. Like, when we're talking about dating lava flows, creationists will usually not mention that the weird dates that they are reporting on are for xenolith inclusions, that is, inclusions in the rock that did not completely melt in the lava, making them older than the lava flow itself. So I will withhold judgment on whether or not the dates you will be reporting on are inflated until you start talking about why they are inflated. Yeah, and to answer that, we're going to need to start with a quick recap of how radiometric dating works, uh, of, of course, if you're a regular viewer, you're likely at least a little bit familiar with how it works since we've discussed it on previous episodes over the years. As a semi-regular viewer myself, I can confidently say that if you learned how radiometric dating works from these two guys, you might have a general picture of how it works, but you'll be missing some key aspects of it to be sure. But let's explain it again, and then we'll look into these radio halo thingies. Ooh, that sounds sciencey. <laughs> well, I, I'm not a physicist. You're not a physicist. I'm guessing um, most of our viewers aren't physicists. I didn't want to scare people away. What could possibly instill more confidence in your ability to accurately describe various aspects of a scientific phenomenon best understood by nuclear physicists than two guys laughing about how they're not physicists? Now, to be fair, I'm not a physicist either, but the thing with that is, if you're going to be explaining why the mainstream scientific consensus is incorrect, you need to be qualified to do so. If I, an unqualified YouTuber, can find problems with your talking points, then just imagine how many more problems an actual nuclear physicist could find. Okay, radiometric dating. The first thing we could say about dating methods in general is that the great majority of them, and there are about over 200, uh, give ages that are too short for evolution. Really? Okay. Now, are these actual dating methods, or are these the creationist impressions of dating methods, like the recession rate of the moon or the salinity of the ocean? I hope you elaborate on that. Spoiler, they don't. Only about 10% of dating methods give the long ages that evolution needs. Right, yeah. And if we approach that fact scientifically or logically, it would make the most sense to go with the majority of dating methods as perhaps yeah. indicating something about the origin of the, the Earth and the universe. I would tend to agree with that. If 90% of the dating methods that are actively used by scientists provide ages that don't allow for the possibility of evolution, that would be a serious problem. Which is why I am very curious as to what these dating methods are. When scientists date ice cores in Greenland using more than 40 different methods, all of which agreed that it was 110,000 years old, your numbers suggest that only 20 of the dating methods all told can give us old ages, meaning that best case scenario, only 20 of the dating methods used for the ice core could have resulted in old ages, but more than 40 did. How'd that happen? One of the keys to understanding dating methods is realizing that every single one of them involves making assumptions right. about things that cannot be known for sure. Yes, and one of the key things to understanding the creationist problems with dating methods is that they always harp on these supposed assumptions as if the possibility of incorrect starting assumptions are not something that are well accounted for. Like, the ice core that was dated with 42 different dating methods. The methods all agreed on the age. Do you think they just kept going with different methods for shits and giggles? Or is it maybe that we recognize that there are certain assumptions that go into the dating methods, but that different dating methods will have different starting assumptions? You mess with the starting assumptions for one dating method, and it will either not affect the results of the other dating methods, or it will have a different effect, giving the two methods wildly different results. So, yes, there are 
are some starting assumptions, and scientists go out of their way to double-check these assumptions and control for any inaccuracies that might result from a faulty assumption. And those assumptions introduce error, sometimes huge errors, into the calculated date. They can do, yes, which is why, as mentioned, often multiple dating methods are used and results are compared. There are also some dating methods that work in such a way as to basically eliminate the assumptive nature of the starting assumptions. Using a dating method that can have an isochron diagram applied, like rubidium-strontium dating, is one such method. Multiple samples will be taken, and the various ratios of parent and daughter isotopes, as well as their ratios with the non-radiogenic isotopes, will be plotted on a graph. Any contamination of the sample at any time will cause the graph to not be linear. Isochron dating is hard to summarize quickly, and rather than go into the nitty-gritty of it here, I'll I'll just leave a link to my video on dating methods where I plot simplified graphs to explain it in a way that should hopefully not give anyone a headache. Addressing the students, I used a measuring cylinder to illustrate how scientific dating methods work. My picture showed a water tap dripping into the cylinder. It was clearly marked so my audience could see that it held exactly 300 milliliters of water. The diagram also showed that the water was dripping at a rate of 50 milliliters per hour. I asked, how long has the water been dripping into the cylinder? Immediately, someone called out, six hours. Yeah, that's a decent basic analogy that can help you understand the gist of how radiometric dating works, but there are a few inaccuracies that I feel like are going to be exploited to make radiometric dating look like much less of a sure thing than it is. For one, rocks that are radiometrically dated are basically closed systems. Nothing leaves, nothing enters. Sure, it is possible that there could be contamination, but the kind of event that would be required to introduce contaminants to the crystalline lattice of a rock would definitely show signs. The rock would be partially metamorphosed, at least. In fact, go talk to a geologist sometime and ask them about all the different types of rocks and what conditions were needed to form each, and you'll end up down a rabbit hole of all the different potential conditions that a rock could face in the crust of the Earth that will have different effects on it, resulting in different types of rocks. Without fail, any time I do a video that touches on geology, I end up reading about types of rocks that I have never heard of before, because there are just so many of them. Today's rock is migmatite, a category of rocks that are formed by a partial melting of the metamorphic paleosome during the intense heat and pressure of prograde metamorphism. What I'm trying to say here is that the kinds of events that would lead to contamination in the rocks are also the kinds of events that make specific kinds of rocks, and geologists are aware of this and are able to figure out what's what. Back to the dripping tap analogy, the dripping water is obviously supposed to represent the decay rates of the various isotopes. Well, in reality, the decay rates are not like a faucet. There aren't taps that can be turned to change how fast or slow an element decays. And while we have not been around long enough to actually measure the half-lives for most elements that we use for dating, it is important to recognize that we don't actually use the half-life in the calculation. It's an easy matter for a scientist to measure the decay rate itself, which then gets plugged into the formula to figure out the age. They don't just grab the half-life from a textbook and use that for their calculations. And because measuring the decay rates is relatively easy, it has been done repeatedly. And other scientists have used this fact to double-check the assumptions that the decay rates don't change. And it has been found that, yes, they are constant. Any perceived variation can be explained by measurement error rather than any actual change in the decay rate. This is tested repeatedly, most recently in 2018. A better analogy for radiometric decay would be melting ice in a climate-controlled room. That one's still not perfect, but it's a step in the right direction. Then I surprised them. The problem is that six hours is the wrong answer. They looked puzzled and disbelieving. I set this experiment up, and I can tell you that the water has only been dripping for one hour. Can you tell me what happened? You see, that's why it's a bad analogy. Maybe he messed with the tap. Well, we check for people messing with the tap regularly and find that nobody has. Maybe he started with water already in the beaker. Well, dating methods that use the isochron diagram don't have a problem with that. It's measurable. Like, really, to think that no geologist except for the handful of creationist geologists have ever thought that maybe some daughter element was present when the rock formed is just silly. If something is so basic that it could occur to someone with zero education in the field, I feel like it's a safe assumption that the people who spend their entire lives studying it are already aware of it. Also, fun fact, the geologist being quoted here, Tasman Walker, was a young Earth creationist before he finished his thesis, 
but his thesis contains such statements as the age of the complex is 225 plus or minus 4 million years old. All members have the same age. The individual ages determined using the argon argon 224.2 plus or minus 4.8 million years and the rubidium strontium 225.5 plus or minus 2.3 million years methods are within error of each other and in remarkable agreement. The results also agree within error of the previous potassium argon determinations. So he is familiar with checking rock ages with multiple different dating methods to rule out assumptive problems. Also, given the dating methods used here, I would assume that he is familiar with isochron dating as well. And then there's the fact that using argon as a dating method requires careful extraction of the sample to avoid contamination with atmospheric argon. So the fact that the argon date for his thesis matched with the rubidium strontium date means that he is aware enough of potential contamination to have taken steps to prevent it. But I guess that makes sense, since it's the secular scientists who haven't thought of contamination as a problem, not the creationist ones. Now, I'm skipping the rest of the analogy. It goes exactly where I expected it to go. Someone might have messed with the tap, or there might have already been water in the beaker. Shocking, I know. But we need to cover some basics first. I mean, we we want to ease into this physics stuff slowly. <laughs> physics is like anal sex. Go slow and let it back into you. And for God's sake, don't forget the lube. That's right. <laughs> Let's talk about how radiometric dating works. Only igneous rocks can be dated this way. Incorrect. All three categories of rock, igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary, can have radiometric dating methods applied to them. But the accuracy is best for igneous. The dating of metamorphic rock will give you the date of metamorphism, and for sedimentary rock you're actually dating the individual sediment grains, which is not an exact method for getting an age of the rock as a whole, but a rock cannot be older than its youngest grain. So this can still be a helpful tool for pinning down an age for sedimentary layers. That's a rock that was formed as a result of cooling lava or magma. When the molten material cools and becomes solid rock, that's when the radiometric clock starts. The rock will encapsulate something that is radioactive, and over time the radioactive element decays into something stable. Yeah, there's nothing egregiously wrong with that part. You may continue. To get a date for the rock, the amount of the radioactive parent product and the amount of the stable daughter product are both measured, and then the age is calculated. Yes, and I'm sure you're about to point out that we don't necessarily know how much of the daughter isotope started out in the rock. If there was already a bunch there, it would make the rock look older than it is, right? But one thing you'll notice in a lot of papers that rely on radiometric dating methods is that they often use several methods. Something also might have happened to allow the parent isotopes to escape, which would affect the age calculation as well. But once again, this is something that scientists are aware of. In fact, it is a fact that has been used to date young eruptions. Argon in particular escapes rather easily from heated rock. So when you find a granitic xenolith in an eruption, its argon clock was most likely reset to zero during the eruption, meaning that an argon 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 dating of the xenolith can give you an accurate age for a fairly young eruption. So the idea that scientists don't account for contamination or the loss of materials when they sometimes use this very fact as part of their dating methods is patently ridiculous. That's right. Now note that scientists don't observe and measure the age of a rock. No, they calculate the age based on their observations and measurements. They observe the current decay rate. They observe that in our constant testing of decay rates, nothing changes them. They observe the ratios of parent and daughter isotopes, and in some cases observe the ratios of each of those to non-radiogenic isotopes, which will allow us to directly measure any contamination or loss of either isotope. They observe any signs of contamination or loss, and don't use dates that result from calculations on any of the isotopes that would have been the results of contamination or loss. They then repeat this process for multiple different isotopes to check their work, just in case they miss something. It is almost completely measurement and direct observation. So no, nobody stared at the rock for millions of years, but they don't have to. They observe and measure isotopes in the rock, and the isotope concentrations can be measured very accurately, that's not the issue, but isotope concentrations aren't dates. So how would you suggest that we date anything that doesn't have a date directly stamped into it? There are very few finds of any kind that actually have a date attached, including archaeological. Would you say that we should throw out anything that doesn't have a human date written by human hands on it? 
there goes almost everything we know about the history of the planet, which, yeah, I guess is what you guys are after, since part of the history that we know is that the world wasn't flooded 4,000 years ago. Except some of how we know that is through Egyptian writings that sometimes had dates on them. So either way, young Earth creationism is still wrong. So with that explanation, it might be a little easier for you to see where the assumptions are, right? Yes, with your drastically oversimplified explanation that didn't bother to explain how the assumptions are accounted for and tested, it is easy to see the assumptions and not so easy to see how they would be accounted for. Now explain isochron dating. I've never actually seen a creationist tackle isochron dating. I'm not prepared for that. I'd like to sometime. Now I'm skipping them explaining the assumptions. The three that they bring up are that the initial conditions are known, that the decay rate is constant, and that there was no contamination. They just take too long to say that. Now all three of those assumptions cause huge errors in the dates, and we'll get to some examples of where the dates were way off in a few minutes. But we're going to focus on the second one, that nuclear decay rates have been constant all the time. The rate has to be the same, otherwise the calculated date is, is going to be inaccurate. Correct. If the decay rate changes in ways that we can't predict, then that would mess with our dating system. That being said, different elements have different decay rates. So if you change the decay rate of one element, that would throw off that date, but then the secondary dating method would cease to agree with the first dating method. In order to get them back into agreement, you'd need to also change the decay rate of the second element, and you'd have to change it by a different amount. Here, let's do a spreadsheet. I've plugged the elapsed time formula in and manually entered the half-life beginning amount and ending amount, just so we can see what effect changing the half-life will have on this calculation. So we start off with things fairly straightforward. Element 1 has a half-life of 100 time units, let's call them years, a beginning amount of 1,000 of the parent isotope, and an ending amount of 497 of the parent isotope. Element 2 has a half-life of 200 years, a beginning amount of 2,000, and an ending amount of 1410. This has them both mostly agreeing on the elapsed time, with one showing 100.87 years and two showing 100.86 years. Now, if I change the half-life of element 1 to 150, the calculation now shows the sample age to be 151.3 years, now disagreeing with the results of element 2's calculation. So if I bump the half-life up for 50 years for 1, let's just change 2 the exact same way. So if I add 50 to element 2's half-life, it now shows an age of 126.08, as opposed to element 1's 151.3. Okay, so it looks like it's a ratio thing. You'd have to change each half-life by the same ratio in order to make them all still appear to match up. So every radioactive element that we use for dating had to have its half-life adjusted by the exact same ratio, except it's even more complicated than that because a lot of dating methods just aren't this simple three-variable calculation. They rely on decay chains and the fact that some radioactive elements decay into more than one daughter isotope, some of which continue the decay chain. So not not only do the decay rates have to change, but for some of these intermediate elements, it would have to change at a different ratio, and the ratio at which it decays into daughter elements would also have to change. All this to say that, if the decay rates have changed, God went through a lot of trouble to change them in ways that would completely undermine his creation story. Seems like a bit of a dick move if you ask me. It's like trying to measure elapsed time with a clock that sometimes runs really fast and other times runs really slow. That's a useless <laughs> clock. So the assertion here is not only that the decay rates did change, but they have changed more than once and might still change? That is quite the assertion. And again, all the different elements would have to change simultaneously at the same ratio in order for this to still work out. And even then it wouldn't because of the decay chains and the ratio of daughter elements for the decay chains that end in more than one daughter. Will the creationists disprove radiometric dating? Will the guy on the right stop making that weird scrunchy face? Will they finally talk about the thing they said this video would be about? Tune in tomorrow for the thrilling conclusion of Radio Halos Ruin Radiometric Dating.